not in, there we go, in the text, uh, the Greek text. It is con contained in verse uh, 4, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. That is the key. Someone has to walk after the spirit. That is, after the spirit's teachings. That's what he's emphasizing and stressing. Verse 3, the law could not do, talking about the law of Moses, and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the critical factor. If not for his sacrifice, if not for his sinless sacrifice, all of us would be still condemned. There would be no hope. Absolutely no hope. But yet Jesus Christ fulfilled all the law's demands and in, ushered in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So then he goes on talking about the fleshly mind and the spiritual mind. Verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. He's contrasting the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. And again, let us emphasize and stress that that word translated flesh in the King James and translated flesh in several other versions is the word flesh. The NIV, as well as other translations, translate it, or actually it's not a translation, they render it sinful nature. That is not a translation. That is an interpretation. That, in fact, is a Calvinistic interpretation of that phrase, sarx, which only means flesh. It does not mean sinful nature. He's talking about the mind of the flesh versus the mind of the spirit. Verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We ended up last week by talking about the indwelling of the spirit. The fact of the Spirit's indwelling cannot be denied. It is something that is a fact. The Spirit indwells the child of God. Anyone who denies that denies plain Scripture. Now, how does He indwell the child of God? That is another question altogether, which we discussed in the lectureship that we had back in March at Faulkner and had a very good panel discussion on Wednesday of the lectureship week, we had uh, four panelists that participated, and it was a very good discussion back and forth between the two positions. That is, those that teach and believe that the Spirit indwells a child of God by means, that is, through the Word, and then those who teach and believe that the Spirit indwells a child of God personally. Those two positions, one advocated by the late Guy in Woods, the other advocated by the late Gus Nichols, both of them, I think, um, uh, in other words, you can hold one or the other and not be out of fellowship and not be sinful because these are matters of opinion. The fact is the Spirit indwells us. How does He indwell us? That's something that will be discussed and discussed and discussed until the Lord comes again. As long as we do not teach that the Spirit operates today as He did in the first century, which is to say raising the dead causing the lame to walk, causing the blind to see, causing the deaf to hear once again, as the miracles of the first century were performed. Now, if you start teaching that, then you're teaching against what the New Testament plainly indicates, which is the age of miracles have ceased. We do not have people being raised from the dead today, even though there have been those that have made the claim to me well, I know that there are people who have been raised from the dead over yonder, over on the other side of the world. Well, how do you know that? Because there's a YouTube video that shows somebody, wait a minute, a YouTube video that shows somebody being raised from the dead and that's the proof? Well, sure, yes. Or somebody will say, well, I know that somebody was raised from the dead because back in 1896 there was a, a uh, testimony in writing that somebody got, no, I don't want that now. When somebody is raised from a tomb that's been dead for four days and the body's beginning to stink, then we can talk. But other than that, that's just going on somebody's word. I want the proof. I want the proof and the power that is demonstrated. Uh, if we start teaching direct operation of the Holy Spirit today, that's a whole, other, all, whole thing altogether. But the fact is, the Spirit does indwell the child of God, as Paul affirms here. 
and as he affirms in several other passages. And that's going to be a key point as he goes through this very important and very comforting chapter. He continues in verse 10 where we pick up our study. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, he's just said the spirit indwells the child of God. And now he says here in verse 10, Christ is in you. He's not saying if Christ, that is, he may and he may not be. He's t- the, the idea is since Christ is in you. That's the idea. Not only does the Spirit indwell the child of God, but Christ indwells the child of God. And there's one other that indwells the child of God, and that's God himself. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Godhead indwell the child of God. Again, the question is how? We'll leave that question to another time to discuss. The fact is, he does. They do. And that should give us immense comfort and immense encouragement. And that's the intent of what Paul is writing here. Here, There's a contrast. He's contrasting the body is dead because of sin. This body that we inhabit, this fleshly body, is decaying. It is dying. It will eventually Go back to the dust from whence it came. That's the nature of our body. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Isn't this same, doesn't this same apostle say in another passage that our inward man is renewed day by day? There's a constant renewal. Even though our outer body perishes, our outer body gets old, our outer body uh, develops pains and aches and different kinds of things that hinder us. The inner man, the spirit within us, never decays. It never grows old. It never gets worse. It's renewed every day. And he says the the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Now again, the question is not whether or not he indwells. He does. He's saying the idea here is since. Since the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Somebody asks, well, what does the indwelling spirit do for the child of God? Here's one of the things the indwelling spirit does to the child of God. When the final judgment takes place, that is, when Jesus comes again, and when the resurrection happens, the general resurrection of the righteous and unrighteous, he says the spirit is going to make alive your mortal body. That is an amazing thought to consider. It will quicken, make alive your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Make you alive how? That's something I believe that is beyond my pay grade. Understanding how that happens. 1 Corinthians 15 comes close, the closest to any passage that we have in talking about the spiritual body, the nature of the spiritual body. Uh, But here he just affirms the fact that there's coming a time in which this will happen. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. We're not debtors to the fleshly side. That is, that's not what we're living for. For if you live after the flesh, you shall or you must die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. If you live after the flesh, then you are going to die spiritually. That is your destiny if you continue to live that way. But here's the key. You've got to put to death. That's what that word mortify means. You must put to death the deeds of the body. And he says when you do that, You will live. 
You know, Christianity is a violent religion. I'm not saying it's a violent religion in the sense that we actually put to death people. Even though there have been those over the years who in the name of religion have put to death groups of people. I'm thinking about the Crusades as well as other uh, pogroms and other uh, things that have taken place to kill people in the name of, in the name of Christ. That is completely false. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Christianity is a violent religion in our own life. Putting to death the deeds of the body. That is a violent process. And that's what Paul intends to get across with that. If you are going to completely do away with that former life that you lived, you've got to kill it. You've got to kill it. Whatever is hindering you from living a life as a child of God, whether it's sex, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whatever it might be, cursing, envy, lust, greed, put it to death. Kill it. Kill it. That's what Paul's saying. Put to death the deeds of the body. Because if you do that, then he says, you will live. Now again... Those that say that the child of God cannot do anything uh, as far as uh, uh, living the life of Christ, that it's all the Spirit doing it, they've got to deal with this. That is to say, if I can't do this, then Paul's telling a lie. Can I put to death the deeds of the body? Well, he says, it's uh, verse, uh, uh, verse uh, 13, through the Spirit. So is it something that I can't do except the Spirit does it for me? No. The Spirit gives us help, yes. How? Again, that's one of those areas that's out, out of my pay grade. But still, the fact is, we must put to death the deeds of the body if we are children of God. Now, we can discuss and debate about what through the Spirit means there. But the fact is, if I can't, if there's no way that I can, even as a child of God, do it, then it's God's fault if it doesn't happen. It's the Spirit's fault if it doesn't happen. If I have not put to death the deeds of the body, and if I can't do that, then it's the Holy Spirit's fault. It's not my fault. I don't believe that for a second. I do not believe that for a minute, that it's the Spirit's fault that I can't put to death the deeds of the body. I've got to be involved in the process. My will has to be conformed to the will of God and the Spirit. Now when that happens, as a child of God, then with the Spirit's help, yes, I can put to death the deeds of the body. I think that's what Paul's getting across here. And to say that we can't in any fashion do this is to indict God, Christ, and the Spirit, which is something I am not prepared to do. Verse 12, uh, verse uh, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We must be led by the Spirit. Paul makes that very plain. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. Does that mean that I'm going to wait for some leading or urging separate and apart from the Word of God, and if I don't receive that, then I'm not a son of God? No, that's not what he's talking about here. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How are all children of God led by the Spirit? We're led by the Spirit as we conform to the Spirit's Word, the Spirit's teachings. Is not the Word of God described as the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17? Did not Jesus say in Luke 8, the seed is the Word of God? Does seed have life in it? If the seed produces after its kind, yes, it does have life. So does the Word of God, the seed, as Jesus describes it, does the seed produce life? Yes, it does, every time that it's planted in a good and honest heart. So the seed has life, but what is that life? That life is the Spirit. So when we conform to the Word of God, what are we conforming to? We're conforming to the Spirit's teachings. He guides us through His Word. 
as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. You know, I can listen to all sorts of religious people and all sorts of religious groups that say, well, the Spirit told me to do this. The Spirit said for me to teach this. And I can't find it in the Word of God? Well, who do I believe? Do I believe that person making that claim or do I believe the Spirit's teachings? I'll stick with the Spirit's teachings. And so if we go by what the Spirit actually teaches that we know He has taught, then we are being led by the Spirit of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, let me make it very clear to those who may be watching this on videotape. I am not saying, and I have never said, that the Holy Spirit is the Word. That is not the case. The Word is the instrument the Spirit uses to convict the sinner and to convert the sinner and also to convict the child of God and if need be to convert the child of God back to the truth the spirit works through by means of the word we know that to be the case so as many as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear verse 15 but you have received the spirit of adoption Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have received the spirit of adoption and not the spirit of bondage again. Remember, he's talking about, he had been talking about earlier about the, old, the contrast between the old law and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The old law, as good as it was, could never redeem anyone in this life completely from sin. It was a bondage that you were in. He says, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That is, fearful of what might happen down the road because our sins are not forgiven. That's not what we're in. He says, you have received the spirit of adoption. Adoption. That's a very interesting way to put it. We are the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. But how can we be sons and daughters of God? Through adoption. That's a very interesting way to put it. And a very appropriate way to put it. The Apostle Paul develops this thought in other places in his writings, but especially here. We are adopted by God. Verse uh, 16, the Spirit and the King James, this is a very bad rendering. The Spirit itself, no, 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 not itself, no, 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 no. The Spirit himself, that's what the word is. The Spirit's not a thing, the Spirit's not an it. And unfortunately, that rendering, the King James, along with other, uh, several other passages where it does the same thing, have given people the wrong idea about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's not a ghost. The Spirit's not a spook. The Spirit's not something that haunts us. The Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. The Spirit himself, not itself. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So how does the Spirit Himself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God? Does He do it directly? Does He tell us directly that we are the children of God? Well, no, He does not. How does He then bear witness with our spirit? When we are obedient to the gospel, the Spirit's teachings... The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit. We have conformed to what the Spirit has taught us to do. And because of that, we know the Spirit Himself bears witness through His Word with our spirit. I know within myself when I have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ that I have done exactly what God wants me to do. I have done exactly what Christ wants me to do. And I have done exactly what the Spirit teaches for me to do. The Spirit himself bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God, that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. 
heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So we are children, sons and daughters, through adoption. We are children. Well, if we're children, then we're heirs. You know, we hear a lot of times about people being heir to a fortune, heir to wealth, heir to all of this. And that's something we just you know, sit back and are in awe about, you know, people inheriting millions of dollars and, and uh, a fortune and wealth and property and all this. Children of God have the ultimate inheritance. It doesn't matter how much money or how little money you got in your bank account. It doesn't matter if you own a house or if you're renting a house or if you don't have a house. You've got an inheritance waiting for you that far surpasses anything that the Rockefellers could have ever enjoyed or that the Vanderbilts ever had or that any major uh, family in the United States or overseas have ever had. You know, Bill Gates is supposedly the, most, uh, the wealthiest man in, in America. After the big crash of 2008, he lost a few million dollars, and I'm sure you've been crying to your coffee ever since over him. But still, he has all that wealth, still, all that fortune, and as a child of God, what I have far surpasses anything he could have ever enjoyed. That's waiting for me, and that's waiting for you. All of us, no matter who we are, no matter what position in life, no matter what the color of our skin, no matter where we come from, no matter what, all of us, as children of God, have this inheritance. If so be, that's conditional now, this, this inheritance that we have. An inheritance is always conditional though, isn't it? A will, a testament, you have to meet certain conditions. Here's one of those conditions. If so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. There's suffering that we must go through to have that inheritance that we are promised. For I reckon, verse 18, I think, I count within myself, I'm considering this, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, in this life, we go through a lot of heartache, don't we? If you haven't, you will. If you haven't suffered, you will suffer. Uh, this life has that constantly as a part of it. If we suffer, then we need to bear through it. And Paul is going to give us the reasons why and how we can bear through it. The sufferings of this present time, this world, this old decaying, uh, fallible world in which we live that has so much crime, so much misery, so much degradation, so much heartache, so much chaos, and so much genocide, is nothing, nothing, not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For... The earnest expectation of, the King James says, the creature. The text reads, the creation. The earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation or the revealing of the sons of God. For the creature or the creation was made subject to vanity. Not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. This world, when it was created originally by God, was perfect. Physically perfect. Until sin entered in. That's when the degradation started. That's when the decay started. That's when all of the problems began. Because, verse 21, the creature or creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now he's not talking about a reconstituted, reformed, recreated earth. That's not what he's referring to. He's talking about the fact that there's going to be some sort of liberty, some sort of glory of the children of God that's yet to come. That's, of course, at the second coming of our Lord. For we know, verse 22, that the whole creation groaneth 
and travaileth in pain together until now. When Paul wrote these words, that was so true. Rome was having a lot of internal strife, even as he wrote these words. Nero had not yet really shown himself to be the despicable tyrant that he would become. Yet he was about to do that in just a short while. But yet you had all of these usurpers that tried to uh, undermine the Roman authority. You had all these barbaric hordes that were constantly a thorn in Rome's side. You had all of this uh, uh, natural disasters that would take place periodically throughout the empire. You have this normal process of the world that's already been taking place. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Sin is the problem. Sin is the cause. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. He says, now contrast the sinful world that's going through all this groaning and travailing because of sin and because of strife. Now look at us who had the first fruits of the Spirit. The first fruits of the Spirit would refer to the miraculous gifts that had been given to the apostles. And then the apostles would transfer to those on whom they laid their hands. He says, even us in particular, he says, we ourselves, talking about him and the other apostles, groan within ourselves. We apostles do the same thing. We groan. Why? Because we wait for the adoption or the redemption of our body. We are looking forward to the time that our bodies will be changed. And we will receive that glorious spiritual body that's been promised. Now, verse 24. For we are saved by hope. Or in hope were we saved. Did you know that you're saved by hope? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That's what Paul affirms. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? What is that hope he's referring to? He's referring to the hope that he talked about in verse 21. That is, delivering from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The redemption of our body, as he'd already said. So that's what he's talking about. The hope that we have is that hope of being set at liberty from this body. This old body that's keeping us down. This old body that hinders us so much. This old body that doesn't do what we want it to do as it once did years ago. I used to jump, I used to run, I used to do this, and now I can't. Well, that's that old physical body and its limitations. Your spirit still wants to do it. Your body can't. You're wanting to be redeemed from this physical body, right? Of course. The apostles were. That's what we're waiting for. But, verse 25, if we hope for that we see not... Then do we with patience or endurance wait for it. We're hoping, we're enduring, we're waiting for what's lying ahead. What we will receive. Now our 8070 friends say that happened at the destruction of Jerusalem. I don't believe that for a moment. That is complete and utter fabrication. He's talking about what's going to happen at the end of time. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit, the King James says, itself, it's himself. The Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's one of those verses that always continues to fascinate me. This is one of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us, which is not through the Word. There are several things the Spirit does for us that are not done through the Word. This is one of them. 
And the reason why we know about it is because the Spirit-inspired Word tells us. But the Spirit, he says, makes intercession for us. Now, the Spirit is not the mediator. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is our go-between, yes. He's our mediator. But the Spirit is an intercessor. How? Well, look at verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Okay, let's put that together. The Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Does that mean there's some sort of special language that the Spirit uses? No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's what he's saying. The Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Whose groanings is he talking about? I firmly believe he's talking about our groanings. Have you ever been to the point when you have prayed, when you're in such distress and you're in such a state of mind, you're so upset that the words can't come? You don't know what to say? Have you ever been there? If you haven't, you will. You will be at a point sometime in your life where you try to pray and the words can't come. You're trying to pray and the words just simply, you, you don't know what to say. It's then, I believe, that the Spirit makes intercession, especially for us. He takes our groanings, the things that we don't know, we, we can't really formulate it, we, can't, we don't know what to say. The Spirit makes intercession for us. He assists us in the throne room of God. And so, verse 27, He that searcheth the hearts, that's God, of course, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. He knows what the Spirit is communicating to him because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Does that not give you immense comfort to know that not only Christ is your mediator, but when you are in prayer and you are in such a state that you don't know what to say, you don't know how to say it, that the Spirit knows, He understands, and He takes that to God. And God knows. God understands. Christ knows. Christ understands. That gives me immense comfort. Immense comfort. Now, I know that there are those that have used this to try to say that there's some sort of special spirit language. I don't believe that for a moment. I do not believe that for a single moment. He's talking about what he does for us at the very throne of God. And that gives me, at least, peace, inner comfort to know that. Then verse 28. One of my favorite verses in the entire New Testament. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. If I started talking about this verse and what it means to me and what it has meant to my family over the years, we'd take another hour talking about it easily. This verse right here has given me a lot of comfort in moments that I really didn't know which way to go. We know that all things work together for good. Notice he did not say all things are good. That's very important. He didn't say all things are good. No, he said all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. That's Christians. To those, who, them who are the called according to His purpose. I may not understand why this is happening to me now. I may be in utter turmoil. I may be in difficult, stressful situations with my family, with my friends, with my loved ones, at, where I worship, where I, whatever it might be, at work. It may be a situation I have no idea where to go or how to turn. But if I remain faithful and true to God, 
All things will work together for good. I can look back on it years from now and see God's hand at work. I may not see it at that moment. I may not can perceive it at that point. But I can look back on it later on if I'm faithful to the Lord, if I don't turn away from Him. And I can see God's hand at work all the way through. Now I realize there's some of my brethren that are teaching that Romans 8, 28 doesn't say that. There's some of my brethren that say that the things, all things, are all the things he's talked about from Romans 1 to Romans 8. I don't believe that for a moment. This verse right here, if it doesn't give immense comfort to all children of God going through suffering, then what is it there for? It, yes, we know that all things, that all the things that God has prepared for us, the gospel, the, the system, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Christ's sacrifice, all these things work together for good. Yes, we know that. But in this context of Romans 8, he's talking about the contrast between the creation that is in travailing until now and the redemption that we're about to receive. What we're going through now, the sufferings that we're going through now, we know all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. I hope that you never have to go through an extremely distressful time where it really makes you question. I hope you never have to go through that. But if you do, remember what Paul says here in Romans 8, 28. Please remember it. I don't have enough time to talk about an aunt of mine who's now passed on who this verse got her through an extreme situation. But if it had not been for Romans 8, 28, and the promise that was, that was involved in it, she would have died much, much, much sooner than she did. If I have some time, I can tell you the story on a personal level, not here in class. But it, this verse means a lot to me. This verse means a lot to many of us because we know the truth of it. We know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to those who are the called according to His purpose. If we can learn that truth, we can get through anything. And I mean anything that Satan throws against us. And when you do that, you become much stronger because of it. Well, all right, well, next week I won't be here. Stan will be teaching in my place. Then we'll resume our study.